All right, this may be one of those days that uh, I wish I had planned things differently. Whew. Ah, last video I came out for my coffee and a hike, and it was the one called Note Meal, and I shared that recipe for an oatmeal replacement. I had shown you a beautiful wonderland of snow, and it was, it really was, actually it still is, but things have changed. That snowfall had been about four or five days old, and it had dropped about 20 centimeters. I'll put um, imperial numbers on the screen for these that, uh, that I mentioned. And uh, yeah, that was nice. It was a nice day out. A little bit of work, clearing snow, that type of thing. No worries, no problems there. Well, over the weekend past, over three days, we here in my area got 84 centimeters of snow on top of that previous 20 centimeters of snow. And I thought, okay, great, you know, uh, where I'm going, snowshoes are not an advantage because of the ups and downs and the bouldering I have to do. Uh, that was mistake number one. I should have brought the snowshoes, at least for the areas where I could wear them, because there are going to be areas I won't be able to wear them, but I could always take them off and carry them, right? That's the thinking I should have had at the time. I didn't. I kind of thought, how bad can it be? I should know. I've done this before, but that's how our memories affect us. 84 centimeters of snow on top, well, then a compacted 20 centimeters of snow is probably like 90 to 95. That is one or three, one yard, three feet on average. I'll put the correct numbers up on the screen again. And uh, oh my, <laughs> the work that I'm going through to get in here is a lot more than I anticipated. I almost turned around a few times. The only reason I'm continuing on is somebody else's broken trail ahead of me with snowshoes and somebody without. It's given me the enough of a compactness that I can ride on top of it most of the time. Occasionally I'll step where someone else hasn't been and I go down to a level somewhere above my knees. Uh, once I've already dumped over sideways <laughs> and I was thankful I had this to help me right myself upwards and get back up on because I was almost waist level there in a bit of a, uh, what do you call it, a snow drift. Okay, all that having said, it sounds like I'm complaining. I'm not. This is a lot of fun, regardless of how much work it is. But what it is doing for me is changing my plans on what I'm going to accomplish out here. So I had a number of things on my plate, most of it testing and the like, and a video, that just another chat for you and I. And that may be all I get done. If I can get set up somewhere without having to go too far into deep snow, I'm going to build myself or make myself a cup of coffee and have a chat. Everything else can wait. It's not that important, actually. You know, this is the things I want to do, right? So what's it going to be about? Well, all I'll say right now is about snow and ice. And you can probably gather from the, ta from the uh, uh, video introduction and on the screen what it is. Yeah, okay. Eating snow and ice. But before you make any conclusions, you're going to want to wait until I have this discussion because it's going to change a few minds. It's going to inspire some people. It's probably going to infuriate a few as well. But that's the fun of this discussion, and I'll tell you why when I get set up. Okay, not going to be a lot of scenic foot footing in this. Maybe a little bit, if I, especially if I find some really great <laughs> snow drifts to fall into. Other than that, I'm going to get to where I'm making my coffee. I don't know where that is yet. And uh, then we'll come back. It's been 40 minutes since I last turned the camera on. I'm stopping to catch my breath and kind of show you. Let me see. I don't know if this will work or not. That's showing up. Probably a little closer than that. Uh, two and a half feet and uh, unbroken snow now. So uh, I'm breaking trail and this is what I've got. Now I'm only maybe 10 minutes away but uh, <laughs> I'm seriously thinking you're not going to see a whole lot more of the hiking footage but when I get there and take a rest and get set up for the coffee. All right, I've dug a hole in the snow behind a big rock. The wind is coming out of the north, so I'm sheltered from the wind. Full on sunshine coming out of the south. It's very, very nice. Actually, it's unseasonably warm. Well, okay, it's not warm out. It's still minus five degrees Celsius. It's just that where I'm sheltered at and I'm getting the full sun, I'm getting the benefit of that. Uh, there's my hole I dug in the snow, my stool, table, and all the accoutrements I need to make my coffee.
probably didn't need to bring a table and a stool for the weight, although they're very lightweight, but I did need something to set everything on and set my butt on down on the ground. Tripod ready to go. And there's the snow outside of my little sheltered spot here. All right, I'm gonna make the coffee. I'm not gonna show brewing it, just, uh, uh, I just wanna get this done. <laughs> not, not, not the video, sorry. Just get the coffee done so I can sit back and relax. Then we'll have our conversation. Oh, that is well deserved. <laughs> very, very nice. Just a little bit hot. All right, let's begin our discussion on eating snow and ice. And just to put the story that I'm going to share with you in perspective, to get to the spot I'm sitting here under this pine tree behind this rock with the sun up there on a beautiful mid, oh, actually it's February, or mid-February day, uh, what I had to do to get here took me an hour a little bit more than an hour for what usually takes me about 35 minutes. So that gives you an idea just how much work was involved in getting here. And I am wet. I don't mind telling you, I just, just re-zippered up again because I got good and wet. Uh, and I say that for a reason. I tell you that for a reason because it plays directly into the story that I'm going to share. So, eating snow and ice. You know, this is a video I've wanted to make for a long time. I'm going to say two, three years, but I really was waiting for an opportunity where there was a lot of snow out here to, you know, kind of give it some realism. You know, it doesn't help much when <laughs> there's not a bit of snow on the ground. Now there's plenty, more than I probably need to tell the story, but you get the point. And every winter, I hear again and again experts, be they YouTube outdoors people, be the experts from whatever area, saying don't eat snow and ice, that it is very dangerous to do so. And it is, it's just never a good idea. Well, there is some truth to that, but not for the reasons that they quote. And the first one is, is because it will lower your core body temperature and create hypothermia. Well, that's simply not true. And I'll get to why it's not true in a moment. And the second reason is, is because it takes so many calories to turn that cold snow and ice and bring it up to body temperature that you'll get dehydrated and weak from lack of food. Again, that's not true. Now, first off, let's put this in perspective. The information I'm sharing is not a bushcraft skill per se. It is about survival. So we'll set the scenario I don't know, I'll let you fill in the blanks. You're out in the woods, deep in the woods, lost in the woods, or injured and stuck in the woods, and rescue is going to be a day or more. We'll say more than a day. And you don't have the equipment you should have brought with you in the first place. So that's what most survival situations are, is a lack of planning or lack of equipment or some unexpected circumstances where uh, you get injured. And that, that can happen. I'm not taking it away. But for the most part, survival is uh, an unexpected set of circumstances. And remember, this is life and death. This is not a, oh, this is a treacherous day out here. This is life and death. And this is the scenario I'm setting for you. And you have no water and no means of melting the snow to create water. And that's, that's key because I will always say, melt your snow first. If you have the means to heat the water or heat the snow up and melt it, then that's what you should do. This is not something you do just because it's fun. You eat the snow and ice because you have to. Now, the rationale has always been you'll become very hypothermic and very dehydrated if you eat the snow and ice. Well, let's just deal with the hypothermia. To start with, I went and I looked at the research, and by the way, I will give you what I have in terms of research supporting my arguments at in the video description below. I did a lot of looking on this stuff. I looked at some incredible stuff, some military tests on consuming ice and snow, and uh, I did some, or actually it was ice water in that test, and I've looked at a thing called an ice diet, where people actually believe that by eating ice, they will lose weight. It works to a degree, but not for the reason they think. It has more to do with suppressing your appetite than it does because you're burning extra calories, raising the temperature up. Hypothermia. I don't know about you, but it is virtually impossible for me 
to put a mouthful of snow or a handful of snow in my mouth and swallow it as is, whole, un unmelted. It's like, for me, it's like a slushy. And we all know what that's all about, brain freeze, right? How much of a slushy can you get down as, if you try to get it as quickly as possible, you know what you're in for. You know you're in for a vicious headache right across here that takes minutes <laughs> to, to resolve itself. And you say, I'm never doing that again. And that's what it's like. If you try to scoop up a big handful of snow and put it in your mouth and swallow it, you just won't be able to do it. Most people can't. I can't do it at least. Try it if you don't believe me. Just give it a go and see what you think. The same thing with ice. Most people cannot swallow large amounts of ice. Little ice cubes, not I mean freezer size ice cubes, but little bits of ice here and there. Yeah, of course you can. Um, but large amounts, they can't. Okay, so if you could swallow down large amounts of snow or ice, then theoretically you could lower your body temperature to a significant degree. Maybe not to hypothermia, but you can lower your body temperature for doing that, by doing that. But you can't. You can't swallow that much. So the truth of the matter is, is you let it melt in your mouth. And you can pick up, well, let's see, this looks pretty clean and that's going to play into this. Okay, that was about, <laughs> a little frozen here. That was about two tablespoons of snow. That's not very much. We'll get to how much snow you would have to actually consume for your daily requirements in a moment. But to get that snow down, by the time it passes my gullet, if you will, or it passes my throat and goes down towards my stomach, it's already at body temperature. Your body is excellent. Everyone's body is excellent at maintaining an internal temperature. So if the body senses that you have something very cold in your mouth, it wants to bring it up to body temperature as quickly as possible. And it will expend calories to do that. So snow is right at the freezing mark. We know that. It's not colder. It's right at the freezing mark. So we'll just say zero degrees Celsius for the sake of argument. I know it's metric and not imperial. And you want to bring it up to 37 degrees Celsius, that which is body temperature. Your body can do that very quickly, very efficiently, without great amounts of energy expended. In fact, you can eat or you can consume your daily requirement of fluids and use less than one meal's worth of calories to do it. Half a meal's worth of calories. Maybe even less than half a meal worth of calories to do it. I'll, I'll put that in perspective in a minute. First off, let's go back. Why would you even bother? I mean, why not just wait it out? It's only a day or two and you're waiting for someone to come. And, you know, you don't have to eat the snow and ice if you, if you uh, don't want to. Why would you risk it? Well, number one, dehydration in the winter is a real thing. And if you don't think it is... Come out and do what I just did. Here's where I came back to my, my hike in. It is a real thing, and it's a real danger. It doesn't matter how cold it is. If you are exerting yourself, your body temperature will rise, and it will try to get rid of excess body temperature in the form of sweat. Okay, I'm still damp, okay, from coming in. When you get damp like that, you are at risk of hypothermia. Now, there are ways. I'm in layers, and I open my layers off. I vented off my heat. I'm drying up very quickly. I'm about to close up another layer here in a minute just to reestablish the, my, my uh, layers and to uh, keep me warm. But you're losing water. You are losing water equally as fast in the winter, especially if you're working hard like I was to get in here, as you are in the summertime. Being cold does not mean you won't become dehydrated because of activity. You certainly will. All right, well, the, how much water do you need? Or what's the risk first? What is the risk? So if you become dehydrated, you don't have to become very dehydrated at all before the effects start to show themselves. Number one, you are at risk of being hypothermic if you're dehydrated. I know, that sounds funny, right? If you start to uh, lose body moisture, body water, you are at risk of being hypothermic because your body cannot manage the mechanisms that it normally does to keep you warm. Number two, as you start to become dehydrated, your physical abilities diminish. Your joints don't work as well. You just cannot do the work that you need to do 
Again, you're in a survival situation. You need all of the energy you have in order to stay alive. And number three, it affects your brain and it starts to make your brain less effective at making decisions. So your cognitive fun functions are greatly diminished as you become dehydrated. And it is a snowballing effect, to excuse the pun, where you, the more things you do, the big bad decisions, you get injured, and if you're injured or sick, that just compounds everything. So you want to remain as uh, energy efficient in all the work that you do and not overexert yourself to any more degree than you have to in order to survive. All right, so there we go. All right, now, all right, okay, I've made the case. You gotta stay rehydrated. You gotta keep enough water in your system. Well, how much is that? How much water do you actually need? The average person, the average adult, and there's some debate whether this is your regular daily requirement or your daily requirement when you're exerting yourself. Either way, the more you exert yourself, the greater your daily requirement of, of water. The average adult needs four liters of fluids consumed daily from all sources. Now, people saying, I'm not, I can't, I never drink four liters of water. Of course you don't drink four liters of water. All, well, okay, I'm drinking some of my daily requirement right here in the form of coffee. And bar the fact that this can be uh, hard on the amount of water. I still gain more water than I lose by drinking the coffee. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's just not, a, not as good for rehydration as straight up water is. Plus, it helps me think clearly, and I enjoy it. It's part of the enjoyment out here. But everything that you eat in the run of the day has moisture in it. The meats, the vegetables, all the fluids, your tea, your water, your, you know, everything that you consume has some amount of water in it. To maintain proper hydration, you have to drink four liters a day or consume four liters a day. That's, that seems like an awful lot of water. Okay, so... If you're exerting yourself, you need more, maybe four and a half, five, five liters. It all depends. And remember, you are losing it. The more you energy you expend, the more you are losing your body's hydration. All right, so I've made the case for being staying well hydrated. Um, and I've made the case for eating snow and ice to a degree. I know I haven't actually gotten there yet. I haven't finished my argument. How much snow do you have to eat? to get four liters. Well, in a fresh snowfall, snow is somewhere around 90% air. So you're only getting, if, if you want four liters of water, you need to consume 40 liters of snow, right? Okay, you're thinking 40 liters, like a huge block of snow. You'd have to have a lot of snow to get the right amount of water. Yes, that's true. However, as the snow sits where it is, gravity itself starts to weigh it down. And within a day, your snow has now condensed to about five to one. So now you're down to 20 liters of snow. That's still a lot of snow when you think about it. That's a lot of snow to maintain your, to consume, to maintain your minimum hydration levels that you need to have. Now, if you can find ice and break up and chip up ice and use ice cubes, that's pretty much a one for one. That's, you know, it's, it's mostly water, probably expand a little bit so it's not quite equal one for one, but it's close enough. And you can just put it in your mouth and let it melt. You can try swallowing them, but trust me, it's, it's better to start with and very hard to otherwise just swallow the ice and the snow. So there's the case. You need a lot of snow in order to rehydrate yourself. But it can be done, and that's the thing. It can be done. There have been case studies. They are post-event where people who have been lost and injured for an extended period of time have survived by eating nothing but snow, no calories otherwise consumed, and survived over, I forget, it was like two or three weeks just on eating snow. A lot of it, mind you. But that's all they had was snow. And don't forget, our indigenous peoples of the far north quite often have to eat snow cold. Now, they prefer to melt it. We all do. But sometimes they just eat nothing but snow or ice for days on end. I haven't heard anybody dying from hypothermia in those conditions. And by the way, I'm, if you can prove me wrong, please do. But don't just say, that's garbage. That's bull. That's not true. You're, what you're saying is garbage because, you know, everybody says it's dangerous. 
Um, yeah, everybody says it's dangerous, but that doesn't make it true. It's the dogma of our, of our world right now where things get repeated often enough that they become gospel, but no one can find the source for it. Please, if you're going to counter me, and I welcome you to counter me, counter me with uh, scholarly articles showing that I'm wrong. And then I'll come back and make a video saying that you're right. I have information to show that I'm right, and that's the way I, I just want to do this respectfully, right? Let's not get into an argument. Let's do this respectfully. Prove me wrong, and I'll be happy to admit it. All right, so back to the story. Eating snow. So you got to eat 40 liters. Now, back to the calorie count. We've established that you're not going to become hypothermic because you could not swallow it fast enough and to lower your body temperature. Your body will uh, braise the temperature of that snow and ice to where it comes to 37 degrees Celsius. How many calories does it take? Well, there, and, and the math for this, the equations are in the video description. I'm not going to even going to try to go through the math. One, because it can be confusing even for me. Uh, but I'll give you the short, the end story. The average person will expend approximately 468 calories each day turning the snow and ice into liquids in their body. 468 calories. A good-sized meal is 1,000 calories, or a big meal. I mean, yes, if some people will eat 500-calorie meals, but when you're out in the woods and you're working hard, that 500-calorie meals don't cut it. You've got to have a lot more calories than that. So your body will expend about half the calories of one meal in order to melt that snow and create it into the need, much-needed requirement of hydration. Doesn't sound a lot, but you're saying, but it's still 468 calories, so you really can't afford to start spending all those calories. Well, here's the thing. If it was all coming from glucose stored in our muscles, you would expend that 468 calories in a day or so. That's about all we can store of glucose in our muscles. But here's the good news. Better for some than others. The average person carries on their body between 130 and 150,000 calories as stored fat. So after a day or two of not eating, your body's going to go looking for energy and it's going to find it in your stored fat. And it's going to, body's going to go into ketosis, which is the, the transformation of stored fat into ketones, which is a really good fuel for burning on. In fact, I, I burn ketones 90% of the time because of the ketogenic diet. Here or there, you're going to become keto in a day or two of not eating anything else. And that's just the nature of That's how the body works. That's what the stored fat will do for you. You've got more than enough calories to last 30 days or better. Carry, you're carrying it around on you. You've got your survival store foods, food stores on your body right now. So don't worry about the calories. Don't worry about the calorie expenditure. Don't worry about creating hypothermia. Eat the snow and ice to get the hydration that you need if you have to. And now let's come back to it. Here's the reality. If you don't have to, don't eat the snow and ice. If you have water or means of melting snow into water, that's what you want to do. It's not an option. It has to be a last choice because there's other reasons for not eating snow and ice I haven't even talked about. I know somebody's waiting for me to say this, right? Don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> okay. I, I had to say it, right? Everybody says this in their, in their videos. Don't eat yellow snow. Well, that applies to a whole bunch of things. Don't eat snow that isn't pure white, period. There are bacteria in the air that the snow will actually drag down into themselves. I've seen snow that would turn red from bacteria. That's up in the mountains and in the West Coast. And I, I would, wasn't even sure what it was. I had to ask, why is the snow all red? And they said, that's bacteria carried in on the snow and it rests on top and it turns the snow red. Never heard of that before. But on top of that, there are all the pollutants in the air. The snow is great at grabbing pollutants out of the air, the air pollution we have, and holding it on top of the earth. It also fixes nitrogen in the soil, which is great for farmers. But I know I'm sitting under a tree and I'm looking around and it's not a lot. It's actually pretty clean here. I could grab some of this snow. But often within a couple of days, all the stuff that's fallen out of the trees, the needles, the dirt, and everything else, not to mention animals that pass by and do their thing, that's all landing in the snow. That all can make you very sick. But it's like drinking water from a stream during the summertime, and you know that it's not a safe thing to do, but if you have no choice, you're better off risking getting 
some type of protozoan in your system than becoming dehydrated. It's the same thing out here. If you've got any option other than having to eat it, don't. Melt it if you can. We can do another whole video on melting snow and ice, but melt it if you can. Uh, otherwise, don't if you don't have to. But if you do have to, don't be afraid to eat the snow and ice. All right, that was a long ramble and it's something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time and I know it's going to be somewhat controversial and that's fine. I don't mind doing that once in a while. Looking at the dogmas and examining why we say these things without knowing for sure the, the science behind it, I think everybody should do that. Question those things that you hear and nobody can explain why they are the way they are. Just wisdom. If you have any comments or any questions, put them in the comments section below. Again, the references I have and the math for that formula for the calorie consumption will be in the video description. But what I would ask you to do is get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.